And now we continue with the highly renowned experts. Well, the Pope of Fashion, uh, well, Dr. Robert Schleif has come to speak to us. Fascia, this is nothing I have to explain to the expert audience. They are the discovery of recent years, what fascia enables us to do, how much in the medical sector, in therapy, many, many things have been neglected, something that can is allowed to do via fascias. Fascias open up a lot, they give you shape, they form an envelope, they uh, will have an impact on our uh, flexibility, our sensory organs, because they perceive how we move, how we stand in the room. So it's really exciting to connect fascia with training. This is all about Schleib's point of departure, uh, shaping training in such a way that endurance, uh, uh, muscle build and fascial tissue get optimum stimulation. And the effect, is that true? Also by means of EMS? Yes, yes, also with EMS. So, uh, latest uh, status quo in research, uh, ideas for training uh, every day by Dr. Robert Schleif from University of Ulm. Thank you very much. Well, when you believe the Bild newspaper, then researchers have either invented or discovered fascia, and they never existed before, and nobody ever did fascia training. I hope you're not nodding now. This is, of course, nonsense. It is so exaggerated. What is new is the high attention paid to a tissue that has always existed, the collagenous connective tissue. And there are new insights now, and we're trying to distinguish between the various uh, types now and what um, pressures or loads um, an Achilles tendon can take and absorb and how I have to dose my uh, load. And in my presentation, I want to talk about how a fascia-focused training can play its role to complement a muscle-focused training, which can also be EMS or a neurocognitive training. And the three uh, different uh, tissue types require different loads and trainings. This is the new insight. And what is optimal for the one is not necessarily ideal for the other type of tissue. So how do they complement each other reasonably? And for the converseurs from physiotherapy, from the pilates area, we remember the model dating back to 92 and developed by Manuel Punjabi. This was developed further now and many people now make reference to it for an optimally functioning uh, joint stabilization. You need three different systems, they say. You need the muscles, but the muscles are, of course, controlled by the brains, the neurocognitive elements, and the uh, muscles cannot move the joint if it is um, stiff. And this is why there are also passive elements that are needed. And now you have to see how they complement each other and where I have to use a lever if there's a slight disorder or if I want to avoid disorders. If somebody, for instance, wants to be a sports person in this hall and in Australia mainly, leading of the past 10 years, um, people looked at the muscles in charge of joint uh, civilization, the cross stability, the politis uh, people actually have accumulated very impressive knowledge about the uh, transversus abdominis, which is the innermost uh, belly muscle that I will talk about a little later, and that it is far more important than the rectus abdomen is um, placed on the outside of the belly and they focused on the functions of the individual muscles and they scored big big successes in back rehabilitation and Australia is still leading in this field right now in the US the focus is more on the brains people say not only the muscle and how can I train the muscle but how can I use the neurocognitive control and optimize it we just just uh, talk chop in football. This is the latest trend now. And in America, nobody does muscle training. People try to actually uh, manage your brains. And 
there are many, many arguments in favor of this. But in both approaches, people um, departed from the assumption that the fibrous connective tissue cannot be controlled that ideally and uh, that th there is no targeted intervention for this, which was wrong. And here, Europe is leading also in sports medicine. The fibrous connective tissue uh, that you see here on the um, uh, uh, table, you can see why this was disposed of, and we've now learned that this is our biggest sensory organ for appropriate reception. It can be a pain threshold, and this is why we no longer discard of it. In an atomic um, uh, preparation, we no longer dispose of it. The current connective tissue concept is that the facial fascia uh, tissue is not only an envelope, um, uh, like to the iliotibial wall, but uh, that it uh, also embraces the intramuscular connective tissue. And there are beautiful examples saying that controlling muscles well is not enough if the fascia uh, architecture is architecture is capable of supporting it. This is a concept that is not really known in Europe. When you bend forwards with um, lumbar flexion, when you now measure this, when somebody actually leans forward slowly, then the erector spine actually jumps in at 20 degrees. The further down, the more the muscles have to pull and to flex. But at 25 to 30 degrees in the healthy human body, the back muscles relax. And you account for this because the passive elements, the fascia, the tendons are surrounding the vertebral column and the lumbar fascia themselves actually take over the job of supporting. And this is unfortunately not working okay with most of the back pain patients. So this is why we say when you actually lift loads, you should do it uh, following the standard uh, back school with a straight back because you save the fascia, you don't train them, but you uh, optimally, optimally l load and stress the optospina. But um, if you always do this, lift loads uh, uh, or weights with a straight um, pain uh, back, um, then of course you're not training the fascia and you're basically losing it. It's going to be as, as thin as, as possible. And then um, when, in, when you're really drunk uh, or you're not concentrating, uh, you actually bend forward and lifting weights with a round back, um, um, uh, then the fascia tears. And, 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 and um, uh, my brother, who's working at a construction site, uh, says, well, you should do it more often. And I want to see whether when you do it regularly with a bent pa uh, back, um, you can actually bring it up to two millimeters. This is like a rubber band that I have in my back. And this is what we want to have. A beautiful argument why this is in fact so, and the, the fact that uh, fascia uh, structures do a supporting job, but only from 25 degrees of lumbar reflection, is the fact that small kids still bend down in Broca style. The first year they're standing up, they're always doing it from the hip. And one um, explanation is that the um, lumbar Fascias have not actually grown and build a connection with the progresses, the vertebra progresses. When uh, the, uh, uh, this connection is not adherent enough, however, then the erector spine can, of course, not do the supporting job like in a healthy person. But as soon as this connection is adherent enough, it would be smart from our brains to say, well, I'll hand over to the muscle now, and from 
25 degrees onwards, I gradually uh, actually shift the load to the fascia. And it would make sense to actually combine the bending um, types um, with a round back, with a straight back, to actually distribute the load better. What's new, and that's the fact that the lumbar dorsal fascia has a third structure, and this is connected um, here to the transversus abdominis. Whoever has learned to actually activate the inner unit with the right brains, with the right muscle activity in Pilates, um, this is probably not enough. If your lumbar dorsal fascia, especially the third layer, is felted, is not um, showing the right geometry, if it's not thick enough, and if the fibers are not, um, if they're parallel, instead of being formed in a clause grid, or whether they're multi-directional. If you have the wrong fascia architecture, your brains can send the um, impulse, the muscles are pulling right, but if the tissue has the wrong, has a weaving defect, then um, what uh, Serge Krakowiecki has explained here does not work. Interesting structure here. And the collagen fibers, you can see, are linked this way. This is a natural graphic. And when you tighten the transversus abdominis, what happens is that you bring the tip of the transverse processes closer together. Now, Poisson is a French engineer uh, 150 years ago, determined what he called the ratio of how much travel you have here versus how much travel you have here. And the best tissue had a Poisson ratio of one, which is one inch here will generate one inch there. The fascia has a Poisson ratio one. This is the ultimate in efficiency. And this is an example which I did to show you how contraction of transverses extends the spine. Because what bothered me was when you have a weightlifter, he fires his abdominals. Don't tell me he fires the abdominals to go down. It would make sense. He fires his abdominals because there is a gearbox called the fascia that brings him in reverse. So, is it okay, uh, then video okay. can you you can actually find the video online. Serge Grakowiecki is the uh, uh, lumbar dorsal fascia necessary. I, this is highly recommendable. So um, this is of course paradoxical. When you actually go back up again, spinal extension, that you do not relax the uh, belly muscles, but activate them, but this only works if you actually have this 45 degree clause grids in the back. By training uh, this way, rotatory movements are good to train it. Um, whatever it is, uh, rope strings, so both collagenous directions must be activated in everyday life. Sagittal movements are not enough to do that that fascias themselves can be a source of pain is uh, no longer disputed. Ten years ago, people didn't know yet, but uh, we found nervous ends, especially in the lumbar dorsal fascia. So there will be a fascia back pain in future, but we don't have a reliable functional tr um, diagnosis and examination for people suffering from back pain. So so that we know after five minutes of testing, um, well, you need a fascia therapy. You have to train your muscles and you need psychotherapy and you have to change your diet. Unfortunately, we're not that far yet. But um, this can be expected. And then, of course, you want to have a therapist um, who know how to train the white tissue, not only the red tissue and the brains, because very often the felt, the wrong architecture is down there, not just up in your brains. So you need different approaches depending on where you have this glued effect. Sore muscles, well, we always thought that the, it was caused by Z disc uh, disorders. Uh, this was um, became clear when we did electric stimulation, and we thought that the pain 
pain is not actually uh, caused by the fascia envelope, but by the muscles inside, the red fiber contractive uh, tissue. But it, this is obviously wrong, as we found out and learned over the past two years. So when you're suffering from sore muscles, and I now stimulate with an electric needle to find the sore muscle, one day after the load, then I find that um, this is uh, the epimesium, uh, the casing, so to speak, when you talk in sausage terms, and this is what hurts. So the smallest uh, stimulation, whereas inside the muscle, there's no pain. And when you then touch the brachialis, the same thing. So the sore muscle is locally caused by the muscle casing, by the envelope. Why it is in pain, we don't know. Maybe it's micro injuries, but maybe it is just the free nervous ends. But we know that fascia can hurt and many soft tissue pain is probably caused more by the fascia uh, than uh, by the muscles inside. This is of course a big thing for back pain because there is a globally leading research. It works fine. So this is a new images and I'm really proud. When you have a, a chronic back pain patient and places, place this patient um, on flat uh, on his belly and then actually pass an ultrasonic head um, over the back and you actually lift the table in the middle where in the healthy patients the erector spine muscles shift versus the skin and the fascia um, the whole body fascia um, which is fixed through the ultrasonic head so this is the epimesium, the uh, bottom white casing, so to speak, and it can be slid or shifted versus the uh, um, envelope uh, fascia. But people with chronic back pain don't have this sliding. Um, there's no sliding taking place. They're stuck to each other. Proprioception, as we learned lately, is mainly caused by receptors for sliding movements. Here you can see these uh, uh, shifting receptors, but if the two layers are glued to each other, I mean, you can meditate for 20 hours a day, you will not actually produce an effect because these layers are stuck together. So we first have to do away with this adherence and actually separate the individual layers again. And this does not work with muscle training alone. And this does not work um, by training the nervous system alone either. In 2014, Professor Ingo Froböse, he's one of my uh, icons, said what many other people said. If you look at the muscle and how dovetailed the white fascia envelope is with the meat inside, can you show me one movement that only trains the contents but not the casing? The fascia is always included in every type of movement. This is convincing because it is plausible. In the meantime, most people have changed their view over the past three years and say fascia cannot be trained exclusively, but they can be trained as focused as cardio training. For instance, a person doing cardio training um, does a different training from somebody training against uh, muscular atrophy. And, because uh, somebody actually who uh, actually does exercises in a fitness club also da trains his cardio system more than a sedentary lifestyle person. But somebody who does uh, running every day, uh, every three times a week, uh, will actually train muscles as well, but not as well as somebody who does strength training at a club. So what would the ideal training look like? One reason 
reason why many experts, including Mr. Forbuza, changed their minds is the research done over the past few years. Here in California, for instance, where um, artificial tendons were grown, and this really excites me. You take red collagen uh, from meat waste, no longer containing cells, and form it into a tendon. Um, then you place it in um, the petri uh, dish and um, you actually introduce live connective tissue cells and tell them this is your new home so multiply and I'll feed you on a regular basis and then they actually uh, uh, migrate into this artificial tendon and you can see how the gene expression changes which genes are activated when I apply a cyclical or a static load. And um, on this research is very elegant, very revealing, but unfortunately also very expensive. This is Keith Barr. We had him two weeks ago at a conference in Ulm, and he endorsed what we saw with Michael Kerr. You need a certain threshold value. If you only have one, um, um, extension then the genes for gene expression are not switched on they remain unchanged so you need a certain threshold value and then it no longer makes a difference whether you double the load or not so it's like a light switch and this is different from from muscle training older people for instance um, have to work and uh, train with 50 percent maximum load the muscle grows but not as quickly when you uh, apply the full load um, muscle training is more like a dimmer the more i dim up physiological speaking the more it turns on the growth of muscle fibers in collagenous uh, fiber it's more like a switch on or off for the tendons, 50% 50, 50 of the load, the full load, is not enough. You can hop every all day long. The Achilles tendon is still fast asleep. It will not improve. You have to hop up and down. But the question is, how many times? So the intramuscular connective tissue, I didn't know two years ago, um, suffices with 40 to 50% max load. But for the tendons, you need high dosage. So they're parallels to the high intensity training that some of you do with EMS. The question of repetition was also studied by him at his lab. With uh, 40 cyclical loads, there is a strong uh, effect. If I add another 400, then the increase is minimal. And you run the risk of uh, um, obtaining or triggering pro, uh, counterproductive processes. So for tendon training, not for cardio training, it would be enough to do five minutes um, of rope jumping for five minutes twice a week. Also important, this is why it's at twice a week, this comes from the um, from Michael Kier's laboratory in Copenhagen. When you actually have this high intensity load in order to strengthen your uh, lumbar dorsal fascia so that it can actually hold more load without tearing, over the next two to three days, the fibroblasts are actually ramping up their collagenous uh, production, but the waste um, disposal is faster. There are osteoblasts and osteoplasts, if fibroblasts do both jobs, they also remove old collagenous uh, tissue. And the blue curve is the uh, uh, top curve, the upper curve, minus the bottom curve. So in the first one and a half days, you have a net degradation. So more uh, collagenous fiber was reduced. And this is by most people say, if you're really interested in the fascia strength, then please do not jog every day, but Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because then the likelihood is bigger that the co collagenous buildup or generation prevails. This is new, and I wasn't happy at all to see this. 
we have our own um, um, connective tissue researcher, Aram Patsis, in Berlin. And he has looked at our hopping. This is what we propagated for fitness, and uh, uh, we brought it up from, from the treasure trove. <laughs> he looked at it and um, try to find out uh, the effect on the strength of collagenous fiber in the Achilles tendon. And it did do so. He compared this with a static um, extension, 15 seconds of maximum load. And he now developed a protocol that he refers to as tendon protocol. Three seconds of high load, three seconds of a break. And this uh, multiplied by four. And here, the tendon is actually built better than by hopping. So we have to give it some thought. So if somebody really wants to promote tear strength, then this four by four second training that you do with EMS, probably more uh, valuable. And it is the faster method to strengthen the Achilles tendon, um, a better method than hopping or rope jumping. But it's only about stiffness. And stiffness is, of course, important if you want to prevent injuries. With um, hopping, you probably produce a better effect on the elastic recoil. Uh, kangaroos can jump that far. Human beings um, are uh, so uh, uh, flexible compared to gorillas and chimpanzees because we have a higher elastic recoil in our collagenous fibers. So the collagenous fiber is like a steel spring. I introduce movement energy and 90% of this energy actually is returned by a uh, saved catapult energy. And this can be trained. This is the Achilles tendon of a couch potato. You actually, um, it springs back with a loss of energy. But if you actually do hopping or running for three months, then the Achilles tendon is not getting uh, stiffer, but it is more like a rubber spring. The kangaroo uh, effect is produced. And this works uh, hand in hand with the geometry change. And the best study available was done uh, with um, Finnish uh, pensioners uh, over 70 years old and they uh, were made to hop for by 10 seconds. Um, granddad, just for 10 seconds, hop quickly now. And not a single one had an overload problem. Then the dosage was increased. And in week 11, um, most studies last for three months if you really want to change the architecture of the geometry. In three weeks, you can improve your brains and you can strengthen your muscles, but you cannot strengthen your Achilles tendon. It takes three months. And this is exactly what happened in Finland. At the end, they actually hopped for seven times 10 seconds. And the result was that the re elastic recoil improved substantially. And this is youthfulness. You would refer to it as youthfulness because in old age, the elastic recoil decreases. And you can hear it and you can see it when granddad walks down the stairs when you compare it to the grandson. And this elastic recoil can be trained. And Torn, uh, Vater, Jan, um, uh, Jan's exercises were better um, suited. In muscle training and in research here in the hall, and Ingo Forbuser said it yesterday, is to its high intensity training. It works better for many, many things than moderate training for many, many hours with all of the benefits and drawbacks. It needs to be dosed individually to um, um, avoid uh, disorders. And this is basically our lighting switch example. So EMS is in part compatible with some of the philosophies that we found in modern tendon training. So uh, you attentively train 
Let's so read, uh, don't read the build newspaper and train your Achilles tendon. You have to really focus. And we talk about embodiment. Somebody uh, with a body friendly attitude should do this um, because otherwise you get the tear injuries. And I'm almost ready to conclude. Um, who, um, well, if you want to train your brains, you should d definitely do it. And um, in very few minutes, you can actually introduce a change. You don't have to have 20,000 repetitions for a new pattern to be absorbed. If you activate dopamine, and this is always what happens when you're passionate about something. So you write in this hall. You're in the perfect place. We scientists uh, frown upon the um, motivation bombs, the fitness trainers that everything that find everything great. For dopamine, this is wonderful. This, this, this uh, way uh, trainers uh, see themselves, but now against the neurocognitive backdrop, it is correct. So if you want to switch on your brains, um, um, it, try to produce dopamine, and then your trainees don't have to repeat 20,000 times. But tr please try out. Uh, don't be boring. Um, so try to switch on your brain switch as well. If you do muscle training, EMS is one of the uh, uh, most um, potent uh, possibilities. So with high load, stimulate muscles to develop more uh, power. And another thing is downhill running. You actually uh, use people have people uh, run on a treadmill downhill, and it's the same. We we actually cause micro um, fractions or fissures um, that are then cured again to make the tissue more resilient. And last but not least. If you don't train the fascia, a tissue all of the uh, uh, um, runners know this. Um, they are most susceptible to knee problems or plantar problems. If you only run twice a week, you're not so prone to um, Achilles tendon disorders. So making sports or doing sports means that uh, you're not ideally training for fascia. And this is why we learned now G regeneration breaks of 48 hours should be allowed for if you want to train your tendons. What's the take home message? Well, best for health and for preventing injury is what you learn here in this hall. It's good, it's correct, and it is state of the art. So highly dosed muscle loads, but these should be complemented, and this is uh, the focus of our university work. You should combine and supplement it with uh, spring type uh, loads, hopping and uh, rope jumping. But the re because of the recoil um, capacity, can better be restored by the spring type motions and last but not least never forget about the brains and there it makes sense to introduce variation do not always bend the knee in, in the same way. Mr. Schleib, you're doing it wonderfully, uh, but you are doing it fine. Your neighbor is not doing fine yet. There is perfect for the muscles, but there can no, there cannot be a perfect exercise for the brains. And for fascia, it is good uh, to actually bend the knee in an X position, slightly X type, so that you strengthen this fascia. Um, because if you actually save um, the uh, cross tendons, then you will not actually uh, um, uh, strengthen it. If you say, well, I uh, may only train one of the three muscles or for one year or just brains, neurocortical or fascia training, the third one, 
if you have to decide for one of the three, which one would be the best for your brains to prevent AD, for instance, and for to increase the amount of multitasking that you can do aged 80? Is it the uh, brains training, the muscle training, or the fascia training? Who's in favor of the brains training? Muscle is clear. For muscles, I have to train muscles. No, surprise, surprise, not right. Muscle training is best for the brains, not fascia training. And here you're right. Fascia training cannot replace muscle training and neurocognitive either. If you really want to stay young, you go to the fitness studio. Uh, you could read the Bild Zeitung, I hope not. But the myokins that you are producing cannot be produced by fascia training. This is messenger substances that are actually released by muscle training that work as anti-aging agents to keep the muscle young. But since you have so many muscles, this anti-aging substance, IGF for instance, is actually introduced into the blood vessels and this actually rejuvenates your brain. So if you had to make up your mind for one thing carry on with muscle training but my recommendation is switch on the brains in addition and try to also train your fascia thank you very much Robert Schleip, Robert Schleip. thank you very much well he always rocks the whole, well, uh, the uh, fascination amongst the audience. And you too, uh, you get the award. It uh, was uh, really very good. You uh, uh, actually witnessed his last presentation during this EMS symposium. Thank you very much.